My sins, his blood, white as snow. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, beloved, you have your Bibles. Would you join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? 2 Corinthians. As we take a week off from our series of series, we have a couple series going that are renewing the mind and also uh, warnings and wars or woes, warning and woes. We take up a uh, a matter that's pressing upon every local New Testament church, I would suppose. Second Corinthians chapter three, and we're going to begin the reading at verse seven. If the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more do the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not stand fastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. For even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You may be seated, beloved. Thank you for standing. Join me in praying over today's message. Is the truth being hid in plain sight, or is it near? Is the truth being hid in plain sight, or is it near? Father in heaven, Lord of glory, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you in the presence of these your people that you would speak from your word that you'd make known your will and your ways that you'd be glorified in and through this message today that the burden that many of us have for reaching the loss and to see the church built up and established in the faith. Lord, help us, Lord, during this great time of apostasy and the haze, spiritually speaking, that is so thick you can almost cut it with a knife. We give you praise in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. I can remember a certain preacher saying that if a church hasn't had members 
to come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, that there should be a church meeting. I've revisited that statement by this certain preacher to say that if that's the case, perhaps what we should have is a prayer meeting. And then after that, a church meeting. When was the last time someone was saved as a result of this ministry here and received believers' baptism? And we can put our hands on them because they are in a local New Testament church. When was the last time that you heard of someone that you know and love dearly? That they had come to a saving knowledge of who the Lord Jesus Christ is? What about someone that you don't know but you've heard about them? You you know them. They are saved. Do you have any idea as to how many messages have been preached? from this one pulpit of the Community Baptist Church, and I would even venture to say even our sister church here, and there's been no movement toward salvation. Is the truth being hid in plain sight? Or is it me? I can remember just a few years ago on the other side of COVID that even in places where the church didn't necessarily want you to be their next pastor, when they heard the gospel, which was something some of them really hadn't really heard by the Spirit, they didn't want you, but that message, you could see something on them. You sensed that the the message had made it home. Then it would be up to them to obey the gospel in which they had heard. But I've never seen a time quite like this where the more we preach the gospel and the more the church hears the gospel, the response is nothing like what it used to be. And I preached among sinners and watched their eyes bulge. And the very message in which the church said, we are here to get behind this message, to see almost stone faces. And and this is across the board. when, When I look at ministers that I know they're preaching the truth, they're teaching the scriptures, that's almost like that's a, his mouth is moving, and but it's as if they can't hear him. The message that we promote all around the world, when it's preached at home, it's as if it's own home drum. That's everywhere. Except when there's a doctrine that feeds into our perceived understanding of what someone has alleged the Bible said, sometimes in a study note. Do do, do you do you sense the burden for the lost that comes along with salvation, it accompanies salvation. It's, it's nothing that you morph into. It's where you want to see everyone saved. No, you don't want to see anyone lost. You want to, matter of fact, know that they're saved. You want to see the fruit of salvation. 
I mean, you want to see the power of God working in their life where there's someone who didn't know the Lord is sitting beside you as a result of you sharing the gospel with them. There is a disconnect in the church, but as far as the world goes, could it be that the reason why they're not coming forth is that they already think they're saved? We've already pronounced Salvation over them without any evidence of any fruit beyond mouthing some words and even participating in believers' baptism. I want to hear someone saying, take me to the water. I want to see someone before they go and be baptized. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Lord Jesus, tears running down your face. And to see the power of God move in the midst of those who have assembled themselves, maybe thinking that they'll take some pictures and some photos and a video, become guilty before God. Somewhere, there is a great disconnect. This will be part one. There's no way that we can get all of this into one message. But it's the truth. Being hid in plain sight. Our first major division is the ministry of mercy. The ministry of mercy. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, Chapter 4, verse 1, the A portion. Which brings to mind that when this was being penned, Paul's own ministry was scrutinized. His apostolic authority and credentials were being jeopardized. By those who had overrun the church. He deals with it in chapter 2. And I want you to look at chapter 2 verse 17. If you would. And he, and he picks it up again. As far as within the community of. What we're going to be looking at. For the next couple of weeks. Chapter 2 and. Verse 17. Paul says, we are not as many or the many. The many here is composed of the Judaizers who were mixing law and grace and then false teachers alike. The many puts the Apostle Paul and Timothy and those servants of Christ in the minority this close to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension, and the birth of the church. The church had been overrun. Paul mentioned this Paul said, for this I know, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in, not sparing the flock. So that would be an attack, and Paul wasn't speaking to the whole church. He was speaking to the church at Ephesus. These were the leaders at Ephesus. 
in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. So that's going to be an attack from the world of grievous wolves. Then he went on and said, but also from among you, men are going to arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples to themselves. So that's going to be an attack from the world, but that's going to be a great division of a split. Where disciples would be siphoned off by these men who would pervert the simplicity of the scriptures for the unsuspecting to follow them. Paul defined the many which corrupt the word of God. You brave. You brave when you can make up your mind, fix your tie, look in the mirror, and go and peddle God's word. Because that's what the word corrupt means. It's to retail the word of God. It's to merchandise the word of God. Is, is there someone who was cast out coming into mind? Merchandise the word of God. That's a perfect picture of false teachers who were at this time in the many which means they were in the majority in Paul's estimation compared to those who were handling the truth of the word of God. <coughs> I listen to men and even women when they're teaching a women's group or even a Sunday school as to how they handle the person of Christ. He's not common. He's not ordinary. He's extraordinary. He's above all that is above, above. And I listen. And you can almost tell someone who's using Christ like a sway back mule to use him to bring him before people that they could never ever be able to get before. Just being who they are. And once they get off of Christ, who's put them where they want to be, then they make it all about them. That was these false teachers. That was their method. Then he describes those who are in the minority. Those are the ones that we can relate to. Those are the men we listen to unless, as I heard it said, when we want to hear what's going on and being taught out there to know how to position ourselves for more of the okie doke to come upon the church. But he describes the minority but as of sincerity. Which means to be pure. No hidden agendas. You know something? Every church can tell if their pastor has a hidden agenda. If you've been around him for a little while, you can tell. Because the agenda is going to rise to the surface. You can't fake it if you have an agenda because that's the agenda. Every church knows whether or not their pastor has an agenda that has everything to do with him or maybe this little group or maybe a, a power system building some kind of an empire. Church knows that. At least you ought to have that enough, you know, uh, discernment comparing what you see in him based on what the word said about him. So the first is to be of sincerity. Next, right here, verse seventeen. But as of sincerity, but as of God. You can translate this, 
but as of God or but from God. Paul has in mind, we were sent by God to you. That's not on your resume. You don't have those credentials. It was God who called Paul to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God the Father. Of God. But not only that, in the sight of God, and this is, this is where it just goes, when you thought this passage or this particular text couldn't go any higher, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. In other words, if Christ had been there and these words needed to be said by Paul or by Christ, Christ would have uttered these same words because the words that Paul uttered were given by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit hears, that's his ministry. He listens for the voice and then he repeats those words through the vessel he's chosen. Christ would have just repeated. Now, this is the Son of Man would have done that. Let me clarify because he's God and Paul is not. Neither is any of his servants that were with him. In the sight of God, speak we in Christ. That, that's why. That's why I don't. I want to come before you. I know when we we have a, a time of fellowship and we we laugh a little bit. But when it's preaching time, it's preaching time. It's the it's the ambassador's opportunity to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. I just want to ask that question again: Is the truth being hid in plain sight, or is it me? Is it bothering you that no one has been born again that you know anything about? And if you do, we haven't heard about it. They haven't been to this church. We, we haven't been told to pray for them. Where are they? Are they? Have they started a work? A great work? I look at this as being what Christ called it. This is my father's business. So someone ought to be getting saved. Someone ought to be taught the word of God. Someone ought to know God and to know him intimately and fully. And it would be a 24-7 job. 365. In Paul in chapter 3, the time, Paul said, man, listen. I know that when these guys came, they came with letters of commendation. They had letters to say that someone had signed off on them in the ministry. And it was as if Paul was saying to them in, in chapter 3 and verse 1, do I need to reintroduce myself to you? Do, do you need a letter like you got from the others? When you read it, do you see the other? That's the other of the many. That's not the other of the ones who were sent by God. But they came having credentials by man. And then Paul said, or do you have a letter for me? He just cuts to the chase. Listen, since we're talking about letters, you are our letter man. You are our epistle. In our heart. And Paul loved the church. He loved the church. And during this time, there were those who were questioning him. Paul knows what it feels like to be, he was an apostle, but the apostolic, he, he was also as an elder dealing with the church to know when folk questioning you. Because they don't like you telling them what thus suck the scriptures. With regularity, without a joking face. Because if I laugh, it can't be that serious. If I smile, I mean, how, how, you know, am I supposed to obey? This is the king's business. Paul said, You're known and read among men. That's our credentials. And then on verse 5 of chapter 3, 
Look at verse 5. Listen to Paul says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. That word means. Paul said, listen, it's like this. All what we just said, it doesn't mean we don't arrive. We're not ample. We're not. We, listen. We aren't even fit for this. Our sufficiency is of God. That's where the ability comes in at. That's where the anointing is because it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. Paul goes on to say that and also we are made able to be ministers of the new testament. Chapter 4, verse 1. The banner that's been hung for everyone to see is the ministry of mercy. Therefore, see, we have this ministry as we have received what? Mercy. We do not faint. This is written in another place. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, we don't faint. We may want to. And this message, this part right here, I hope that some preacher and you feel like you're on the edge of the earth. You've been cast away. You've been cast aside. You've been cast down. And folk who are with you, they done left you. And yes, you are. As you look around, you are alone, but you're never alone. You can't lose heart. Because if he called you, you are exactly where he wants you to be for that season. Folk going to come. And, I, and listen, I, I get it. Some of the messages and you all follow, some of you, you follow what's on our page. You start talking about things that, you know, go back to folk and what they started believing when they first were saved. You know, you start ups, upsetting some apricots, folk. You know, they, because you want to know Because we don't read our Bibles. We read notes. We read commentaries. We read what this person said. Why not study the scriptures? Why not read the Bible? And allow the Bible to read you. Don't you want to know his will? Paul is saying, listen, we're not going to lose heart. So here we see the, this is the ministry of mercy. When we come to verse 2, We have the manifestation of the message of mercy. We have the manifestation of the message of mercy. But between verse 1 and verse 2, in verse 1, we, we, listen, we don't want to lose heart. But before we can get to the manifestation of the message of mercy, there's some things we have to lose. There's some things we have to disown. What is it? It's in verse 2. And have renounced, which means to disown, to lose, to let it go. The hidden things of dishonesty. That word could be translated shame. We gotta renounce that. Why would Paul incorporate that between 
the ministry of mercy and the really the revelation of what mercy does and it's truth because he knows that someone dealing with this where you have to renounce disown the hidden things and these hidden things of dishonesty they are characterized in the next two if, if you do these things, they're negative. If you don't do them, then you have dealt with the issue of what's hidden. See, verse 1, go back to verse 1. You don't want to lose heart. But then there's some things in our heart we must, we must lose. You got to disown it. It doesn't become you in Christ. It never did. If that's you, go back to step 1. Repent and be Say through the name of Christ Jesus. Not walking in craftiness. This word ought to remind us of who? The serpent and Eve. Craftiness. These false teachers, they always make the initial step. You see, it was the serpent who approached to Eve. He stepped to Eve to deceive Eve. See, when God sends a man like Moses, he's almost got to make him go. When these false ones come, listen, they will run and they'll catch a train, a plane, they will ride a horse, a donkey, they will run the rest of the way so that they can get up and get in the front of you because they have an agenda that has absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And will not bring glory to his name. Walking in craftiness. Cunning. Using trickery. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. That means to adulterate the word. I'm going to say this in shame. But I know how to fill this place. I know how to get cars on both sides and out on the street. I know how to get folk here that before harvest leaves, there'll be folk standing all around it. But it will require me perverting the scripture. To pervert the scripture is to compromise. I hope you're getting this. You compromise the scripture. That's what adultery is. It's adultery when a man compromises his marriage or wife. It's a compromise. It never lives up to what you had. No matter what the illusion is. And never quite get there because one is right and the other one is wrong. And that's whether you're saved or you're not saved. Because marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled. The whoremongers and adulterer, God will judge. But what about those who well, I'm not going to do all of that, but we don't have all the members. But what if there's some that I'm, I'm afraid they might leave to adulterate the word, to skirt around what I know that they have a problem with, that it might cause them to leave God? Do you know how often that happens? That the truth is not being told wholesale. Not Line upon line and precept upon precept. Hear a little, hear a little. This is where we get to the manifestation of the message of mercy. Look at the text. But by 
manifestation of the truth. So the truth is manifested. Now I ask the question, is the truth being hid in plain sight? So we'll have to deal with, you know, that I, I know next time. But the manifestation of the message of mercy cannot be hid in that sense. It's been manifested. Look at the last portion. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You know what I mean? That God knows how I'm living. He knows what I've been teaching. He knows what I've been preaching. This isn't about a conscious issue with, with God. But what about those who see me? Can they say how I'm living? And how I handle the word of God? It's where the conscience, that when you open your Bible, you, you hear this servant say, well, beloved, you have your Bible. Do, do, do you feel you need to tighten up? Your spirit. Because you fixing to get a belly load of false doctrine. Or can you just open yourself up and say, Lord, feed me. Till I want no more. I want the class work. And Lord, I know you always give me homework to take out the door. You always let me know that we haven't arrived either. Even though we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We haven't arrived yet because our feet are still firmly planted down here on the earth. And someone has said, we are not out of the woods yet. But we're just as good as being out of the woods. When we do come back, we're going to take up this whole matter of the truth. Being hit. But what about you here today? Been in the church a long time. Some of you, I've never heard your testimony. You never shared it with me. Others, you have. What about your life? How's your living? Where are you? More important, where are you headed? Who are you taking with you? Are you on assignment or are you still in the world? I'm concerned. Community, we haven't had no one come down this aisle. And I don't even want to say how long. Something wrong. Something ain't right. Something ain't right somewhere. It ain't right. It ain't right if it be anywhere else. Something ain't right. This message supposed to go outside. When that door swings and everybody clears out, the message then goes out there. And it goes to your house, in your neighborhood, in your community, and into the marketplace when you have an opportunity. My wife and I, we were in a certain place, and this fellow, he, he came in and uh, he spoke, you know, he was very, 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 very polite. And, and you could tell maybe he had a, a little challenge a little bit, that was my first assumption. And he was sitting there for a while, then he turned around, got up. He said, I just have a question I want to ask you. Are you saved? That's a good one. The most important question I have ever been asked in my life, I want to ask you, are you saved? Did you follow a man into the church? I had a man follow me into the church and he blew his wife's brains out and he blew his own brains out. He followed a man. He never knew Jesus Christ. Are you following a man who's in Christ but you're not in Christ yourself? You have no fruit. You don't even know what the fruit of the Spirit
spirit is. You have no desire to know. You know you come and you go. You're in and you're out. You don't know Jesus Christ. His word has no place in you. You know the world. You know the world and you know it well. But are you saved? Do you know him in the pardoning of your sins? Or are you on your way to spend your eternity with your father, the devil, who was a liar from the beginning? Something wrong somewhere. I know there's a haze in the world. I sense that there is stiffness in the church. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know what to do about it. All I know is that we pray and we seek the Lord and we cry out to him in these last dark and evil days. But this is God's business and he's going to handle it his way. But how? what are you doing to get the word of God out today? What are you doing? What are you doing, sis? What are you doing, brother? You can't do it if you don't know him. Inviting someone to church is wonderful, and we appreciate that. But could you tell them what thus says the Lord in order to be saved? We've got messages coming back up on the platform from 36 of them for evangelizing the world and perfecting the church. Those messages were airmarked for your spirit to know how to reach the lost. Let them talk about you. The truth be told, they're already talking about you. They don't like you. They don't invite you to nothing because they don't want you around. Why not pray about a window of opportunity, a fervent door where you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that God sent forth his son into the world. He came down through 40 and 2 generations, born of a woman, born under the law. He lived among men. He died among sinners and criminals. But he was buried in a borrowed tomb. On the third day, my Lord got up with all power in his hand. And when he got up, he kept on getting up. Oh, he didn't leave then, but he was just as good as gone. Because he's headed back to a sin far above principality and power. Can't you see him? When he took off and the disciples were looking up and those two that was dressed in white were just standing there looking and beholding. If those two hadn't spoken and if it was possible for the disciples to be living, they probably would have stayed there. They said, why are you standing gazing into heaven? But this same Jesus shall come back as you see him go. That's how he's coming back. He's coming back on a cloud. He's coming back with a sign and the sun and the moon. That's when he's coming back. That's when he's coming back. And boy, y'all think by that time, if you living, because you thinking some, I know what some of you thinking, but if you living and he show up, you won't be mighty glad. Lord, how you doing? We glad you're here. Can we leave? Our Father in heaven. Give her every good and perfect gift. Restore the eternal life upon as many as you have called by your gospel, convicted, convinced, and converted by your spirit. In the name of your son, the Lord Jesus, Father, I'm troubled in my spirit, a burden that's too heavy for me. When I know that there are lost folk all around me. And those who don't know you, they show no evidence of it. Lord, help me. Because I don't want to lose heart. I want to do what Paul said. Get rid of all that other stuff that's in the way. I want to, I want to disown that stuff. I want to cast that stuff off. But I don't want to lose heart, Lord. Lord, give us boldness. That we will have the wisdom of a serpent. And we'll be as harmless as a dove approaching those who know not you in the pardoning and deliverance of sins. We ask this in Christ Jesus.